Hey everyone, welcome back to Adherent Apologetics. Uh, appreciate you wherever you may be, however you may be joining us. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Uh, we have big conversations about philosophy, theology, and apologetics. Uh, today I'm joined by Dr. Frank Turek. I'm sure you know who he is if you know anything about apologetics. Uh, he's the director of cross-examined written books like I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist and Stealing from God. Uh, Frank, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great, Zach. Thanks for having me on. I hope you're okay there at Liberty with the lockdown going on. I guess you guys just make it work, uh, even though uh, people are wearing masks everywhere. That's got to be such a pain, man. I don't know how you guys do it. Yeah, you know, I think you kind of get used to it day by day. And that's just all you really can do in times like this is just try to get through each day and make the most of it. That's right. All right. What are we going to talk about? Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about engaging Gen Z, um, kind of reaching them with apologetics and the Gospels. Obviously, I'm a part of Gen Z, and Dr. Turek, through his work, has done. he's gone to a lot of college campuses, engaged a lot of college students, things like that. Uh, so we're going to talk about just kind of reaching people in Gen Z and some of the things that he's found that are effective and just strategies, things like that, um, the world we live in today, things like that. So to start off, could you just talk a little bit about, like, what got you into visiting all kinds of college campuses? Like, what got you interested in that kind of ministry? Well, I came to faith through apologetics. So once I got trained in it, I wanted to go to the place where I think it's needed the most. And that's obviously high school and college campuses, particularly the secular ones, because that's probably the most hostile place for, or I guess I should say against Christianity in America, is going to the college campus. And very infrequently do people hear a cogent defense or any evidence for Christianity at that at on these campuses. So that's why we go there. And we not only present, usually I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, but as you know, we open it up to any kind of question. And uh, people like the fact that we have an open mic and can ask any question they want. Mm. So I think one of the m most important things to realize, I'm sure, as you go through um, reaching college students, going to campus, things like that, is just how different the world is today than it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago um, when you were growing up versus when I was growing up, even though, what are you, like 30, Dr. Dr. Oh, Stone? yeah, yeah, I'm just 30, Zach, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got one generation apart. You were part of the millennials, probably. Um, we're about but two. We're... <laughs> no, I'm a baby boomer. I was, I'm 58, so I was, I was born a while ago. But yeah, so, growing up, though, I mean... The sexual revolution happened when I was a young, very young person. So anything post-sexual revolution, anything post-60s uh, has really caused Christianity or at least people who adhere to Christianity to have to talk a lot about the sex issues because that's what's really on people's minds and hearts now, even more so now than maybe even when I was growing up. So that's a big difference, I would say, than if we would go, say, to... Uh, a generation before mine, uh, the issue of sex and I want to do things my way. I don't want to have any sexual restraints on me. I want what are called sexual freedom. That's been a constant and it's gotten more and more pronounced, I think, over the years. Mm. Yeah, I think the, there's a couple of things that I think are really challenging for people my age, especially um, who are either considering Christianity or maybe grew up in a Christian home. There's a few major challenges. And I think one of them is the idea of sex. We have the sexual revolution. We, we grow, we've grown up in a very a world that has no consideration for Christian values and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I kind of grew up right next to Penn State University, one of the biggest campuses in the nation. And obviously it's very, very different than what you see in what we consider holy um, in terms of sex. And I think we live in a culture where we've normalized things that 50 years ago or would have been seen as kind of crazy. And right. I think that's something really important to see as we deal with apologetics is these kind of barriers. So the first one being sex. So when you're engaging people who are in Gen Z, how do you reach them uh, when you have things like, well, to just start with the barrier of like sex. Like I want to do whatever I want with my sex life. Like how do you kind of go through that barrier of objection to Christianity? Well, if it's typically, as you know, when we go on a college campus, we cover four questions in the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist presentation. Does truth exist? Does God exist? Are miracles possible? And is the New Testament reliable enough to let us know that Jesus really rose from the dead? If those four questions are answered yes, because the evidence shows that they're, they should be answered yes, then Christianity is true. Now, as I'm going through that material, sometimes when I'm I'm doing the truth section, I will 
stop at the end of it and say, you know, some of you folks here are atheists or you're not Christians. And I just want to mention to you that I may ask you a question if you ask me a question. And I want to tell you what question I'm going to ask you now, because it's not fair of me to lay it on you in front of everybody without you having an opportunity to think about it. So here's the question I'm going to ask you tonight, if you ask me a question. And the question is, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And I'll say, look, I've had atheists or non-believers stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people. I ask them that question and they say, no. And I say, no, how's that reasonable? How's it reasonable that you wouldn't believe something that, were, that was true? Because it's not a reason problem. It's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. You don't want it to be true. You want to do your own thing. You don't want there to be a God because you want to be God of your own lives. I get that. Most of us are like that. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. So most of us are not on a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest. And we're just going to believe whatever we think is going to make us happy. And the problem is, is you can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun, but ultimately destructive things. Yet over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone who's over 40 years old, maybe even 30 years old, can probably tell you that doesn't work. Mm. All right. If you really want to be honest, you'll follow the truth where it leads, even if it means it might prevent you from doing something you want to do. And look, for any success in life, as C.S. Lewis put it, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary because this is a dangerous world. Mm. Yeah, I think this is a good transition to kind of well, the second barrier that I can see that's causing issues with Christianity is we have things like uh, limitless sex in terms of the boundaries, like there are no boundaries. And we can see the brokenness that has caused a lot of people. I can see this in my own friends' lives or people like just all kinds of people. And I think it comes, one of the biggest issues that I think is barely even being scratched on the surface is this issue of technology. Um, people since the early 2000s have had these things since smart, that called smartphones, which have just changed the way we live our lives with when we have things like social media. Uh, if you look on social media, it's the most followed accounts. They're not people who are promoting Jesus and Christian values. They're people who are promoting all kinds of things that our forefathers would just be amazed that was even allowed in society. So I'm curious, like, how do you think social media and technology is impacting uh, your, not, not just your ministry, but an entire generation in terms of bringing up barriers to the gospel? Well, one of the barriers it brings up is that people have a very short attention span, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we can't live by looking at something too long. In fact, some people might already be tuning us out right now, right? Oh, I got something else on my phone. What else? You know, so you're real jittery. It's like, oh, there's something else that's going to take my attention here because there's, there's, there's a dopamine hit I need to get by looking at something else, right? So we're all guilty of that because that's just the nature of the device. I think one of the other things that technology does is it, it, it does, on one hand, level the playing field in the sense that um, you can equally provide good reasons for Christianity on social media, just like you could provide reasons to disbelieve a Christian on social media. So the world is flat, in other words. We can communicate with everybody in the world in an instant uh, through this medium. And so there, I mean, it's good and bad. It's, it's probably mostly bad because <laughs> people want what they want they don't want to be constrained by anything. And so pornography, as you know, is a big problem and uh, just bad information out there. In fact, I mean, think about this, Zach. Um, well, maybe you don't remember this because you're young, but if you go back to, to my age or when I was your age, say I go back 30, 40 years, you didn't have as many resources to distract you. Uh, you had maybe three to five channels of TV, right? <laughs> Uh, you didn't have YouTube. You didn't have all these. You just had more of a, a unifying kind of source of information. You just had a few networks you could rely on, a few newspapers, that kind of thing. And so there was a lot less uh, disintegration of unity because people were all seeing the same stuff. Now you can completely customize your life to see only what you want to see, right? Right. I mean, if you go on YouTube for any length of time, do you notice that the videos they give you are just the videos that you are about subjects you like? Mm -hmm. You'll never oh, yeah. see a counterpoint to anything. Mm -hmm. You can feed your stuff completely 
any kind of self-talk you want. And that's what leads to division in society. Now, what's the solution to this? I don't know. I mean, I found this on the right? Oh, is, is Siri saying something to me now? I think Sorry. Siri has the answer to this like really important issue. Yeah, that's it. She, she found this on the web. That's the problem. We're finding too much stuff on the web. And I don't know about you, but my biggest problem is not how much information I have. It's which information's true, mm-hmm. right? Where do you? Oh yeah. I mean, you can't you can't even find a good place for data on the COVID virus. Mm-hmm. You know, is this politicized? How do I even know this is true? That's a big problem now. So people are just spread so thin. They're they're out in their driven apart in these tribes based on their own personal identities and really what they're interested in. And there's no unity to bring them together. That's a big problem. Yeah, I think that whether it's politics or religion or any other topic right now, we see so much tribalism. It's like yep. you have to believe in every single point of this party or this r- religious belief. Or if you're an atheist, you have to believe all these things. And there's just so much of it's this camp versus this camp. And I think that we often miss like the whole point of, say, philosophy is just to figure out what's true about right. reality in the world we live in. And I think that you bring up a really important point that I think with reaching Gen Z's, we need to realize how much information is out there. Um, Take, for example, uh, the success of Matt Dillahunty. Um, You can debate whether what he believes is true or not, but the atheist experience has built something really remarkable. I think I've seen they've been on YouTube since the beginning, basically building up their brand. And you can see with things with like YouTube, you you don't have to be a PhD scholar. I'm not a PhD scholar. Um, on any of this stuff, and here I am with the YouTube channel with a few thousand or I don't know some uh, some followers, and mm-hmm. it, and I have no qualifications. I'm just an undergraduate student, and I think that's such a big issue. Is people need to realize that not everyone's out there just telling them the truth. We all have our biases, and we need to get through those biases and find what's true. That's right. And you know, Tim Keller said something interesting not long ago about how the fact that people on social media. When they go from, say, a Christian to, say, a non-Christian or even vice versa, all they're doing is changing cheerleaders, right? Uh, Or you can think in terms of sexuality. If someone comes out as, say, homosexual, now they got a new set of cheerleaders cheering them on. If they say now they're a Christian, they're going to have a new set of cheerleaders cheering them on and also people who are against them. And one of the things that social media has done is it's created a tremendous amount of anxiety and loneliness because people sometimes think their worth is in how many likes they get on their post or how many times their, you know, their Instagram post is shared or liked or what it loved or whatever. And it, we're really trying to find our identity in the approval of others via electronics, not even people who, who we know and love who are are part of our family or part of our friends. It's really crazy. It can lead to a lot of depression. And mm-hmm. so that's a danger we have to be aware of. Yeah, I think that if we look at the statistics, it's potentially Gen Z is the most depressed and anxious ge- generation um, in the modern era. We have, I know it's 90% of people have had some form of anxiety disorder. And I think 50% some sort of dis- depressive disorder uh, in the past 50 uh, among people in Gen Z. I think that Something so important is the impact of social media in terms of what you talked about, like followers. Like I remember I got my first phone in sixth grade and all my friends, like all we're concerned about is how many Instagram followers we have and how many views we're getting on our Snapchat and things Uh like that. That's that's the world we live in today where that's the thing that's seen as the most important thing. Or now it's transitioning into TikTok, like how many TikTok followers do you have? And it's all about followers, me, 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 me. Um, How do we get to God? Because I think that, we get so caught up in ourselves, especially with social media. We're living in an age where there's just so much information out there. There's so much distracting us from God. So what would you say to someone who's just struggling to want to pursue God, to even want to think about God when they're so caught up in their in themselves? Well, it's one thing. I'll tell you what I said to a group in an Ohio prison. They were in solitary conf- confinement, and I was speaking to them. I was going through the, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist material similar to what I do on a college campus. And I'm going through the material and toward the end of it, I said, look, I don't even know why you're in here. Most of them were in there for murder or something. I mean, these are the kind of guys that had tattoos on their faces. Mm -hmm. You know, you can think like MS-13. Anyway, I said, look, I don't know why you're in here, 
But do you realize that you can have the same identity that people on the outside have? Because in Christianity, you do not achieve your identity. You receive your identity. You just accept what Christ has done for you. And you are therefore then a child of God. John, who was an eyewitness of Jesus, wrote that he has given you the right to become a child of God by simply accepting what he's done. So you don't achieve anything. You don't have to have any anxiety that you're not going to measure up, that you're not going to get enough likes or enough views. That's not what makes you who you are. What makes you who you are is your creator. He created you and he redeemed you. And that's how you get your identity. You simply receive it. All the pressure's off. All the pressure's off. Everything else is going to put pressure on you. Social media is going to put pressure on you. Some dream you're going to follow is going to put pressure on you. Some group you're going to be a part of is going to put pressure on you. Man, silence is violence. If you don't say anything, that's going to be pressure on you, right? If you don't say something about what's going on in society right now, man, they're going to come after you. They're going to cancel you. You don't need any of that. You're, all you need is an identity that's just waiting for you. You just accept it. And so what we try and do on our channel, our YouTube channel, on our Instagram feed, on our website, crossexamine.org, is give them good reasons why that offer is true, why your identity is really available to you. Your eternal identity is available to you for free. And you don't need all this other stuff. Mm. That's so good. Um, one last point we're going to go into in terms of reaching Gen Z, and I think this is something that is just starting to come up. And obviously, you know, there's the whole prosperity gospel and the health and wealth and all that stuff. And I think Christians are starting to do a very good job of pointing that out. Uh, but I think there's something else happening, especially on things like TikTok and Instagram, where we have this disillusionment of what the gospel is. Uh, for example, so one of the most interesting things to me is on TikTok, you'll have hashtags, it's like what people are watching, what people are listening to. And take, for example, the hashtag Jesus loves you. And I, I'm sure you would agree, you know, Jesus loves you. And obviously there's a little bit more to what that means, but right. all throughout TikTok, we'll see this thing, this slogan push, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. It has, I think, a billion and a half views, um, this particular hashtag. But then we have things like take theology or apologetics where these things are very minimally viewed in hundreds of thousands or millions. So just a fraction of a percentage. So I think what we're seeing is a push to diluting the gospel to the idea that Jesus is, Jesus loves you. And then that's it. Um, rather than actually giving people theology and apologetics, which I'm sure is something you and I would both agree is so sure. important. So my question is for people who are, living in this world now where the gospel seems to almost be diluted, how can we bring the gospel to people who may not even be able to, who may call themselves a Christian, but wouldn't even be able to say what the gospel is? Yeah, that's a good question. You can't, you can only lead somebody as far as you've gone yourself. So unless you know the gospel yourself, you can't share it with somebody else, right? Um, but the gospel involves the fact that there is a God, you are not him, that uh, you're made in his image and you have fallen. You fall, you fell corporately in Adam, but you also fell you're on your own. You also sinned on your own. And since God is infinitely just, he can't allow sin to go unpunished. Otherwise, he wouldn't be infinitely just. But he's infinitely loving as well. So he wants to take your punishment on himself, and he does in the form of Jesus. And all you need to do to be forgiven of that is accept what he's done, and then he'll not only forgive you, he's going to give you his righteousness. So you're not only forgiven, you're given his righteousness. Now that's the greatest story ever told, and it happens to be true. So you could ask people, look, if Christianity were really true, would you become a Christian? And now they may, they may think, well, Christianity means no, 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 I can't do all these things. Okay, rephrase it. If Jesus really rose from the dead, would you follow him? Just, just try that and see what people say. Now, do you know that the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament? The word disciple is used nearly 300 times. Why? I know it's going to sound crazy, but Jesus doesn't want you to be a Christian. He wants you to be a disciple. There's a difference. Being a Christian is just somebody who says, oh, yeah, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, that's not enough, though. I mean, it's enough to get you saved, but it's not enough to get you sanctified. He doesn't, he doesn't just want you—he just doesn't want to give you fire insurance— 
He wants to bring you into his kingdom and make you one of his ambassadors to go out and bring more people into the kingdom and grow you spiritually so you can enjoy him now and in eternity forever. In other words, there's a mission after someone becomes a Christian. And so I think showing people that the Christian life is very exciting, that you're not only affecting time, you're also affecting eternity. And for the, for the, the, the Gen Z and millennial folks, they're very uh, concerned about justice, which is an important thing to be concerned about. But do you realize there's no such thing as justice unless God exists? Right? Everything's just a matter of opinion. If there's, if there's no God, if there's no standard beyond us, there is no justice. Everything's just your opinion. The only way we can be concerned about justice if A, justice really exists, and we are commanded to try and make things just. Well, how do you do that? Join God's team. That's what you do. Otherwise, you're just out there working alone. Mm. So uh, we'll, we'll close with this because I think this is probably the most common objection from people who are actually will have an intellectual barrier to Christianity. That's being the problem of evil because mm. we're, we're fed lines like Jesus loves you or God loves you. And for some people, that's all the gospel they know. They don't understand the things about the sin, the fallen world. So when something terrible happens, say a family member dies or something tragic will happen, a natural, a natural disaster, which we see happening all the time in this world, we're faced with this question of if God loves us or if Jesus loves us, how could this happen? Because this doesn't seem loving. So I'm curious, for someone who has isn't really interested in, say, the free will defense of the problem of evil or these other intellectual things um, that we have as apologists to answer the problem of evil, how do you answer someone who says, uh, Dr. Turk, why would they? So why would God let my mom have a terrible struggle with cancer, a painful struggle, and die? Or you know, there's all kinds of different forms of this. But how how do you respond to the problem of evil from people in Gen Z? Well, it, it, there, there's two answers to the problem of evil. One is the philosophical answer that you just hinted at, Zach. You know that there can't be evil unless there's good, and there can't be good unless God exists, right? But for people who are struggling personally with evil, you don't want the pastoral answer. I mean, the, uh, the philosophical answer, you want the pastoral answer. So I always ask people when they ask about the problem of evil, well, can I, do you mind if I ask you, why do you ask about that? And if they say, well, you know, my mom just died. Well, you know, going into a philosophical answer, that's not going to help them at all. And not at this point, right? It may later. But what they need is a pastor. They need someone to come along next to them and minister to them and try and comfort them. And pray with them. That's what they need at that point. Uh, at some point, though, I think the the clearest way forward to move past the pain is to realize intellectually that even though you've gone through difficulty, God does exist. He does love you. And he has a plan, even if you don't know what that plan is. Right. I mean, think about evil that has occurred that actually can later bring forth good. Um mm -hmm. You, you could probably think about something in your own life uh, for you, for Gen Z people. My son and I are writing a book about superheroes right now, what it teaches us about God. Think about uh, Spider-Man, right? When does Spider-Man go from a selfish person using his skills for his own benefit to actually saying, man, I can use this really for the good of the world. It's when his own uncle gets killed by a robber who he could have stopped, but he didn't. And as his son, as uh, Uncle Ben, as they call him, is dying on the, on the street and Spider-Man Peter Parker comes up to him. Uh, it, Peter Parker's kind of crying over his, his uncle about to die. And his uncle says to him, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. And then he dies. Right. And then Spider-Man in this in the Marvel Universe is turned around and suddenly now he's an advocate for the little guy. He's an advocate for people who are being um, treated unjustly. Spider-Man never would have become Spider-Man without the death of his of his uncle, his uncle Ben. That's the thing that turned him around. If you want a biblical example, what happens to Joseph in the Old Testament? He's sold into slavery by his brothers. Right. And somehow he goes to all sorts of difficulty in Egypt. And after that, he rises to prominence in Egypt. He puts a whole bunch of grain aside. He's, I think, the third highest, third highest official in Egypt. And then his family, the very family that sold him into slavery, they leave Israel to escape a famine to come to, to Egypt. And Joseph sees them. 
and he recognizes them. And what does he say to them? You dirty rats. Now, now you're going to pay for what you did to me. No, he doesn't say that. He says what you meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of many lives that is happening now. In other words, there's a ripple effect. When evil occurs, it can ripple forward into the future to bring good later, just like it did in Joseph's life. Many times we don't see that. Sometimes we do see it. I think if our viewers right now can think back at times in their own lives when something bad happened to them, and then when they look back on it, they go, you know what? That actually helped me. You had something happen in your life, didn't it? You had your friend. If, I, if, if I'm thinking you're the person that, that I thought I was reading a bio about you, didn't you have a friend die in a car crash? Me? Yeah, yeah. I did. Okay, what did that do? It was a tragedy, of course. But what good came from it in your life? Uh, in my life, personally, it made me question things and actually end up giving my life to Christ. And for many other people, it was a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Right. It rippled forward for good. Now, yes. look, if this, if this life is the end of all life, if there's no afterlife, there's a lot of injustice that never leads to good. But... If this isn't the end of life, if life continues into the future, into eternity, then even evil things that occur in this life, and God has to allow evil if he's going to give us free will, mm -hmm. which allows us to love. If evil things in this life can ripple forward, not only in time, but in eternity. So if you want to say to somebody, why does some bad thing happen to you? I can't tell you why a particular bad thing happens to you, but I can tell you in general why bad things happen, because we live in a fallen world. God has given us free will, and God can even redeem evil into good. In other words, he can turn evil things for good, and he actually promises to do that. Mm. That's what he says in Romans 8. So, I mean, again... That person who's going through evil at the time needs a pastor, but a little bit later you can start giving him reasons and say, hey, first of all, none of this would be evil unless God existed. And since he does exist, it is evil, but he can bring good from it. Look, I mean, we sometimes allow what our kids would call evil, right? I mean, did your parents ever tell you to go to bed early? Never. Never. <laughs> Come on. It was for a greater good. Did you ever get a shot? Yeah, you did. And it hurt. Dad, why are you doing this? It's for a greater good, son. You know, you ever get an operation? Why? It's for a greater good. It mm -hmm. hurts, but it's for a greater good. So, yeah. I mean, I think, in, you know, with these mass tragedies that have happened in history, you know, you, you wonder what, how different the world would be if those things never happened because of people who'd still be existing. And it's just, it's hard to know what, what, how the world would be different if there was no evil. Yeah, you can't know. You can't know how it would turn out. It's a counterfactual claim. All you can do is trust the one who set the whole thing up and knows the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's for sure. God, you know, for sure. And I think through the book of Job and Romans eight and all kinds of passages, we can kind of see that we can trust the person who set everything in the motion. Um, in fact, I, let me say one last thing, Zach, this is really important that I don't want to leave out. Really the only person who was completely innocent that had an awful thing happen to them was Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. And he volunteered to take evil upon himself. Uh, you know, God actually entered the bloodstream of humanity to solve the problem of evil. That's what the whole Christian story is. It's the answer to the problem of evil. Jesus comes into this world to take our punishment on himself because he's infinitely just. And, and he has to punish sin. Otherwise, he's not infinitely just. So... The good that came out of something that was completely unjust is immeasurable because without Jesus, none of us could avoid punishment and be given his righteousness. So the ultimate solution to evil is Jesus, is Christianity. Mm, that's really good. Well, Frank, it's been an honor. Really enjoyed talking to you. Um, encourage you whenever COVID ends, you'll hopefully be able to keep back going on campuses and keep it going. Uh, any kind of closing thoughts you want to give before we wrap things up here? Yeah, just check out our YouTube channel, crossexamine.org. Check out our app, two words in the app store, crossexamine. And of course, our we have Facebook page, Instagram, the whole deal, Twitter, uh, and also our website, crossexamine.org. And one day, I was at Liberty maybe five or six years ago. One day, I'm going to get back to Liberty. Hope to see you there. And uh, you can also see our uh, we do a live show every Thursday night. We have a podcast that goes on every Saturday, which, of course, is you can listen to it anytime you want. And so there's a lot of resources out there for people who really want to know if Christianity is true. 
and also the philosophical and theological principles that go along with that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Turek. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This is Adherent Apologetics. Uh, you can follow us everywhere. You can support us at patreon.com slash Adherent Apologetics. Uh, Dr. Turek, it's been an honor. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Zach. Thanks for having me on. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. God bless.